Good morning. Good morning. So we spent some time, Alan came in and one of our deacons, Sandy, also joined us yesterday and we tested our sound system to eliminate the echoes that we had last week while holding on to our connectivity. And so we've made some good technical advances in what's happening in the sanctuary. So the folks in the sanctuary can hear you when you speak. Hopefully we're gonna add the capacity eventually that if they wanna share, you can hear them speaking when you're in Zoom. But right now we're hoping for a good audio experience as well as every other kind of experience this morning. So thank you to Sandy and Alan for the troubleshooting last night. And you, could, you all can give us your feedback through chat this morning, you know, if you notice anything. But um, yay, here we are. It's the second Sunday of Lent here, as around the world, in the Christian tradition. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox has a slightly different calendar, so they're, they'll just be starting Lenten experiences as a, we're a little ahead of them. But within our tradition, so like Roman Catholic and mainline Protestants, um, we're all observing Lent together. A few announcements for the life of the church, and then we will begin. First is that we did send out one email mentioning to you all that we are doing, the missions has sent along a donation in honor of the church to help with the winter storm relief efforts that our denomination is put, putting to work down in Texas and neighboring states. We're welcoming, if anyone else wishes to make contributions, you can send them to the attention of Jackson Community Church. Payable to Jackson Community Church is preferable or you can drop off cash, however. But make sure that you mark the subject line as winter storm relief or just write Texas on it. And we'll, either way, we'll know what it's for. And we will send along any additional funds that we receive above and beyond the initial contribution that the missions has allocated to that. So that's one thing. Then three events just to bear in mind. Our deacons also created a special mindfulness series for us with Anjali Rose. The first of those workshops is this afternoon at three o'clock by Zoom. You do need to register in advance so if you have an intention of being part of that class and going to her first presentation and you know interactive experience, please make sure to get on sooner and register so that you have the actual link to the actual workshop. The link we sent you is for registration. Next, uh, we have two racial justice or Black History Month events coming up. We didn't really get to announce this properly last week because we were having the audio excitement. So this week, let's try this again. On Wednesday, March 4th, uh, local land con conservation groups have gotten together and they're putting together a program called Inclusivity and Diversity in the Outdoors. We've sent that link out a couple of times. It will be in the upcoming email for this week uh, with this week's events. And Tuesday, a week from now, so Tuesday, March 9th, Tony DeLuca is going to be facilitating a program that focuses on LaDainian Tomlinson's speech when he received an NFL award and the context for that. So those are the events that I know about and the announcements that I know to make. Are there any other announcements for the life of this community? If so, please unmute yourselves and go ahead and make them. Just to clarify the community involvement exercise or meeting is Wednesday the 3rd. You, you conflicted the date and the day, so Okay. Just to clarify that. All right. Thank you. 
I think somebody's paying attention to the calendar because clearly I'm getting things double booked here. So March 3rd, not March 4th, Wednesday, March 3rd. Unless I'm totally wrong, maybe it's... I'll double check. You'll get the right link, right date and time in the email. Okay, sounds like there's no other announcements for the life of the church. I don't see anybody asking to unmute. So in that case, and welcome to, uh, now, before we get going, why doesn't everybody unmute and just say hello to each other? Good morning. 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 We have some very beloved faces that are joining us this morning, so we're happy to um, enjoy their presence. All right, and then we're going to ask Alan to help us center ourselves mm -hmm. with some piano music. So Alan's going to the piano, and here we go. Which is Which is I've been told to uh, channel my inner Lawrence Welk and count and a one and a two and a three before starting because there's a delay between when I turn on the microphone and when it starts to pick up my voice. So if I start talking too soon, you all can't hear me yet. So that was Lawrence Welk. So welcoming all of you <laughs> to worship this morning. We turn to our confession, the second in our series of Lenten confessions, and this one is taken from Psalm 32. We will place the words on the screen for all of you, and I invite you all to unmute and speak together. Blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven. Is forgiven. Whose sin, sin is covered. Is covered. Well, I kept, well, I kept silence. Body waste away. All day long. All day long. For day and night, day day and night day your hand has kept As by the heat, I acknowledge my sin to each other. I acknowledge my sin to you. And I did not hide my sin. I did not hide my sin. Confess my transgression. You are a hide hiding place. Preserve you surround me with Thanks be to God. And now we'll go ahead and mute all of you until it's time for the prayers of the people. We'll talk more again about how important it is to enter the time of Lent with a confessional heart and openness to the presence of God in our lives. That is precisely what the journey calls us to do, to be open and to walk with God. At this time, we now welcome your prayers 
I'm going to share a couple of prayer requests that have been passed along, and then I'm going to ask first in the sanctuary if there are any prayers, and then I will invite folks in Zoom to open up for prayers. Wanted to pass along one, many of you probably already know this, but Reverend Tim Roser, who was a co-pastor at Nativity Lutheran Church for quite a while, and he and his wife raised their children at Mount Washington Valleys, you know, in the valley, and their kids attended the high school here and graduated from here. Tim passed away of a very aggressive cancer just about a week and a half ago. And so we continue to pray for his family, for the grace with which they went through the experience of transitioning from trying to treat his cancer to a hospice experience and saying goodbye to each other. We also ask for special prayers for Roy and Nancy Lundquist. Nancy's currently at MGH right now. She's having some very serious complications having to do with her memory and some other issues. And so um, please pray for Nancy, for Roy, and for their children and their grandchildren as they go on this journey. We'll raise up other prayers together shortly. I'm going to ask first in the sanctuary if there are any additional prayers. Sue Kerrigan has one, so we're going to hear Sue's prayer. A friend in Australia was in a severe auto accident. And please pray for her and her family. Any other prayers here in the sanctuary? Alan has a prayer. Okay. Okay. The previous organist at OLM, who now lives in Texas, her husband is living with stage four cancer. So prayers for an extended and beloved music minister who served this valley, many Christians, many believers in this valley, um, and could use your prayers. Now we turn to Zoom and ask if there are any prayers that anyone wishes to say out loud. Then we're starting with concerns. We'll turn to celebrations momentarily, but let's begin with any concerns. Feel free to unmute yourselves and go ahead. I see Kevin. Uh, yes, Reverend Gail. Prayer for you, Reverend Gail and Chris and Pastor Nathan and Pastor Sue and Jennifer to be blessed. And prayer for Max to have his marriage restored. And prayer for Joanne's dad, who's in the hospital with a heart condition. And prayer for me, please. Okay, Kevin, thank you. Other prayers that you wish to raise up out loud this morning, please go ahead and unmute yourselves if you have one. especially if you're on the phone and we can't see you, just go ahead and unmute yourself and share. Well, then I'm going to name the prayers that we have continued to carry as a congregation. We continue to pray for Gillian's son-in-law, Andy, who's being treated for cancer, for Scamp and Bruce as they receive um, very useful diagnostics and begin next steps for treatment down in Boston. For B. Davis, who continues to live on hospice. For Barry and Jan, who continue their journey with Barry's spinal cord injuries and all the other complexities that come with that. For Richard and Sandra, for Jean's ongoing healing, for Sasha, who continues on the road between different challenges and continues her treatment, for the many people living with cancer, which includes Deanna, Judy, Cheryl, 
It includes Claire. It includes so, so many people that we have named and prayed over and people who continue to be private, whatever stage of their living with cancer they may be in. We pray for people who are caregiving in the midst of COVID, who have been diagnosed with COVID, recovering from COVID, or those who are mourning because they have lost someone due to COVID. We pray for those living with partners or parents or other loved ones struggling with dementia, Alzheimer's, memory conditions, which change relationships and for the faithful partners and family members who journey with their loved ones through these very challenging and long experiences. We do our prayer. I don't see any, uh, I don't think we have any young people we can pick on today to lead our body prayer. Last week, we had um, Kala leading our body prayer, but I invite you this morning, as in other times, please place your hands on a part of your body that you want to pray for as we pray through our bodies. And when I tell you, and I do mean this seriously, every part of the body that we pray for, there are multiple people who are having challenges around those parts of the body. So we're, we're serious when we do this laying on of hands. We are sending out our energy in a healing and a loving way to be present to those parts of the body. And hopefully we name enough of the parts of the body to cover what there may be. We begin at the top. You put your hands wherever you want to send out your energy for yourself or others. But I'm going to start at the top with my hands on my head and begin with the skull and the brain within it. For the mental health, depression, suicidality, altered mental states, treated and diagnosed mental health conditions and the challenges that happen during these times, for Alzheimer's and memory conditions, for epilepsy, for all the different ways that the brain itself can be challenged for tumors in the brain, for literally for things that are happening inside the brain, for ears, for eyes, for nose, for lips, tongue, teeth, throat, jaw, for the esophageal tract, which becomes the GI tract, for our heart, our lungs, our breasts, our lymph nodes and our lymphatic systems, for our spine, and our neck and the nervous system that runs from the brain out to our fingertips and down to our toes and connects us and helps our body talk. For our joints, for our shoulders and our hips and our knees and our ankles and our wrists and our fingers and our feet and our bones. For our stomachs, our abdomens, our uteruses, our reproductive organs, our spleen, our kidney, our pancreas, our liver, our stomach, and the GI tract down to the colon. For the skin itself, for the tendons and muscles that bind us, we ask for holy and healing power to touch the parts of the bodies that are gathered here, that are far flung, who cannot be with us today, but whom you hold in your love and your keeping, O God. And we are your children and we are your body here on this earth right now. And we are, some of us, healthy and strong and some of us in so many ways in need of your presence. And we, your children, with our broken, open lives, we ask for your healing and your presence to restore us, renew us, to give us dignity and peace where healing becomes a letting go and a parting of ways. We ask for your loving 
and comforting presence throughout this journey of being human and mortal, strong and vulnerable all at the same time. And now for any prayers of celebration that anyone might want to lift up. I have one, it's Janice Brodel. Oh, good. <laughs> um, uh, a Friday, the 26th of February was the year anniversary of Barry's accident. Mm -hmm. And um, as, as part of the spinal cord community, injury community that we've become a part of, we've learned that often people look at that day and take it as a time to reflect and look back on things that you've accomplished. So I looked at pictures of Barry, particularly on the 27th, when he just came out of surgery attacked to all these tubes and everything. And we had a picture of him two weeks later. We were so excited he could sit on the bed uh, with the PTs and the OTs holding him for 30 seconds. And then Wednesday, I took a video of him getting out of bed by himself into his wheelchair in two minutes. So we are grateful for all your prayers and your, and your um, good wishes and cards and everything that everyone's done. But uh, thank you for helping us get through this milestone. Mm -hmm. That is a, <laughs> that's about as good of a prayer of celebration as you can get because it gives us the perspective that we probably all need for gratitude. Uh, thank you, Jan. I might cry for the happy prayer. <laughs> happy tears. Bob? I'm grateful that all of us are starting to get our vaccinations. Yes, for, for the vaccinations where they are possible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for Meg and her daughter, who have the, in, uh, heroically actually been trying to track down people that need vaccinations, and I'll just make that announcement in the middle of prayers. Um, Walgreens apparently has had some extra doses from time to time, and they are trying to use every one. And so they've been working with um, emergency contacts in different towns, looking for people 65 and older, and helping them move up their vaccination dates. So if you know of anybody in our community that continues to need a vaccination, please get those names to Meg, and she will pass them along so that if, they're, if that ha continues to happen, they can help expedite vaccinations for people in our area. Go ahead, Kevin, unmute. Thank you. I'm grateful for the saints. I'm grateful for the simple blessings in life. And I'm grateful that spring is coming. <laughs> All right. Yeah, somebody earlier today mentioned longer days and more sunlight the incremental signs of spring re coming to us is wonderful. Other prayers of, so go ahead, Jennifer. Um, I am very thankful that my 26 year old daughter finally passed her driver's test. And um, now we just have to work on getting her a car. So, <laughs> uh. all right, so big milestones. Uh, it's been a long journey. Yeah, I bet. But it, it, it's a move toward me. Congratulations to your daughter. Um, we have a lot of young people who are experiencing important milestones and a lot of young people still in between, betwixt and between, right? You're like trying to launch themselves, but not sure what comes next and trying to create plan B, C, and D for what they're going to do for the next six months or a year while they figure out their lives because college or high school are just different than they were expecting. So for our young people and our every other people who are moving, relocating, choosing next steps in life, discerning what might be coming next for them, um, celebration and resilience and strength, we ask for, for the living into that question. That's a tough one. Any other? Alan's got a celebration. Oh, Alan's niece is starting to take piano lessons, so it runs in the family. So there you go. New generation of musicians playing. <laughs>
I'll just say Chris and I attended a wonderful concert last night that was created by Massachusetts musicians, most of whom we know, composers and dancers and poets and instrumentalists. Um, and they spent a year preparing all of their materials and created a wonderful special performance last night that came out of the experiences of being apart from each other. So turning our challenges into opportunities to grow as people and as communities is a wonderful gift. Let's turn to the Lord's Prayer now and unmute and share our prayers together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Lord, heaven. hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, will be done. Will be done. Will be done. on earth as, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Now we ask God to speak through the scriptures to us. We're going to focus on two more Beatitudes today, and we're going to offer them to you both in the New Revised Version translation and through the message so that you can hear them two different ways. Matthew 5, verses 4 through 5. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And now the same Beatitudes is offered through the message. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. So end the readings. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. First of all, let's acknowledge that the Beatitudes, which speak about those who mourn, help remind us that to, to weep, to cry, to experience sorrow is a very human experience. There are many, many words, both in Hebrew and gospel texts that talk about different words for sorrow, mourning, grief. And if we think that God doesn't know how to cry or weep, we should remember that, first of all, Christ came into this world as a human being to experience, incarnate, and embody what it is like to be a human being. And the fullness of that experience includes stories that we have been told about how Christ wept how Christ wept when Lazarus had died and when he saw Lazarus' sister weeping, he wept. How he cried out for the fate of Jerusalem itself, for the oppression and injustice that he saw within an entire city, and how he cried out for Jerusalem and its fate. And then... How on that dark night in Gethsemane in the garden, he wrestled and he wept with what he knew what was coming to himself. And he asked to have that cup removed. And then he said, but your will be done. Even God weeps. 
And surely God's self in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or Creator, Christ, Comforter, the Creator, weeps with a deeper heart than we can even imagine every time. The earth's children are harmed and hurt every time we turn away or express our own deep lament for the pain within our own communities or in other worlds. God weeps. And then the other part of that beatitude is a promise of comfort. And I'm guessing that we, as human beings, have learned a lot about comfort in the last year. When we have been so hard pressed, not by one challenge, by a multitude of challenges. And perhaps we have a lot of resources with which to respond to them, but that does not make them any less of a challenge. Between pandemic, between political divisions and social uprisings and economic stressors between the challenges that come from trying to educate your children at home and hold down a job or choose between your vocation and caregiving, losing your business, mental health that is extra challenged in these times, even when it's been well managed in the past, all the health things that have been put aside, things that we're just beginning to pay attention to now because the only thing we could pay attention to was the pandemic, the ways that people have had to journey apart from each other. We have had a multitude of reasons to mourn. We have had to let go of so many things that we cherished. And Jan then shows us that model of reflecting and finding even in the midst of that very deep challenge the ways to have a joy that is growing out of gratitude. And I think there sits much of our comfort that we can have a concert by musicians that were isolated and trying to figure out what it meant. The choir that we have grown in this past year that sing apart and then sing together. The musical collaborations of Billy and Alan the creative ways that church has gone outside the building and shown up at people's front doors or in the mailbox so many different ways. The ways our worship team has come together and addressed so many different sensory experiences to allow us to continue to worship together. How have you, in a year full of mourning, experienced comfort? If we all unmuted and talked about it, and we won't do that right now, but the 8 o'clock, which is a smaller group, does get to talk about it. People mention the different ways that they found comfort. One person also named this morning that they found comfort in the flags flying at half-mast this week because we had hit that terrible milestone of losing over 500,000 Americans to COVID. And on a week when we are talking about mourning, it's vital that we acknowledge the toll that this illness has taken. And yet the fact that through our rituals, through our communal acknowledgement, through the ways that we gather, we comfort each other. It's easy for us to point to people in the Bible that mourned, and we talked about Jesus. When we get to the idea of those who are meek and how they shall inherit the earth, I think it gets to be a little bit harder for us to figure that one out. Contemporary language doesn't really use meek in the same way that it was originally intended in the Bible, and so often I believe the connotation people have now for meek is submissive, weak, those who get walked on or tread upon. In its original form, it was intended to mean gentle, humble, kind, 
nonviolent, but also strong. Those who would intentionally withhold the use of the power that they held within them and respond mindfully, deliberately, And when we think about who that might be, some examples of people that in our own time or within the last century have exemplified being meek and working towards inheriting the earth might be Gandhi, Martin Luther King, people who exemplified nonviolence and yet stood up against oppression. To be meek is not to be weak. To be meek is one who exercises strength and focus on behalf of injustice or oppression, who will not be quick to anger, but also will not allow what is wrong to continue unchallenged. We also talked last week about that first beatitude, how being poor in spirit puts you into the position of opening your life to God and how that is what the Lenten journey invites us to do, to open ourselves up, to invite God to walk with us through the uncertainty, the discomfort, all the different ways that the beatitudes name not all the things that make us feel lucky, but all the blessings that come from our brokenness, our vulnerability, our imperfections. Confession, in a sense, is the first step on this journey. But it's easy enough to open yourself up and then slip right back into old ways of doing things. With confession, comes then in the second beatitude, those who mourn, the acknowledgement that my brokenness requires the presence of someone else. Someone to support me and help me through this journey. And in the third step, that meekness that humility that surrenders itself into the presence of holy love with, as we said, those open hands that you are asked to use throughout your journey. Your eyes are asked to turn inward, to turn outward, with your heart and your mind in the act of repentance. And I mentioned to you again that some people find repentance itself a very difficult word to follow, but it means to turn in a new direction. And so if you are being honest, if you have confessed by opening your life to God, turning over what is broken or needs renewal, restoration, or simple comfort and dignity because you can't fix all things, but God can be with you through all things. When you know what needs love and compassion, what direction must you turn in? to open yourself up to that compassion. How must you shift your life, your orientation, your priorities, so that you are aimed at God and you have opened the doors of your heart and your mind and your life to God's self? Repentance is a reorientation towards holy love, sustainable and holistic relationships, and a restoration of yourself 
in connection to the parts of you that may be hurt, relationships that may be hurt, communities that may be hurt, all of the above. Strong back, soft belly. That's what one of my spiritual teachers used to offer as a guide. Strong back, soft belly. She was a teacher who sat with those in hospice, and we were being taught about how to be with those who are dying. We have strong character. We have strong convictions but we allow ourselves to be soft in the front. We try to be, sit upright and hold a strong posture, but we also make ourselves vulnerable. And as we do so, we open ourselves to connection with God. These blessings are not meant for someone else. Today, as you open up your hands, and I ask everyone to open your, up your hands once more in that act of receiving and giving. You, you are the ones who will be comforted. And through you, comfort will flow to those who need it. And you, you are the inheritors of the earth because you are gentle and yet possibly turning yourself with strength into the arms and the love of God and standing for what needs to change as well in your own life and in the lives of others. These beatitudes are given to you. You are blessed so that you may become blessing. Thanks be to God. As ever, we ask for your ongoing and faithful support of the ministries of this church. We are one small church in a very big valley and in a very big world, but the steeples in this valley and the virtual faith communities that have no building at all but gather, all of us, all of us are reaching out to each other and becoming places of hope and restoration, education and creative expression, and the ways that all of you participate in and support these ongoing acts of faith help us become those shining steeples, those invisible communities. I think of the Mount Washington Valley Havara with whom we worshiped on Friday night. They don't have a building, but they gather, they light their candles, they break their bread. We sang their songs, we sang their prayers, and the prayers that they were saying are some of the same prayers that we say together on Sunday morning. We are on this journey together, and your help brings this journey to life and puts all of us to service as God would have us be in this world. Thank you for your faithful donations. Today we'll close out the service with the hymn, The Church is One Foundation. We'll have you sing muted in your own homes. We're going to sing two verses, and those two verses will be up on the screen now, and then we'll close out with the benediction.
And now, friends, we will sing out together the benediction, and then Alan will give us our interlude, and then you are welcome to hang out and unmute for a little bit and visit each other, and we hope you will, especially if you're we haven't seen you for a while. We'd love to chat and catch up, but let's begin with our benediction. Thank you. 